In 1942, two years after Italy's former leader Mussolini declared war on France and Great Britain, effectively turning the country into a war zone. But somewhere in the streets of Milan, amid this war was seven-year-old Leonardo del Vecchio, who was being taken to an orphanage by his mother. Leonardo, in protest, kept crying because he was going to be separated from his family forever. Little did he know that staying at the orphanage was going to expose him to the skill that would one day inspire him to establish one of the largest eyewear empires in the world. This is the story of how Leonardo went from an orphanage in Milan to become the second richest man in Italy, all by just making an eyewear. Leonardo del Vecchio was born on May 22, 1935, to an impoverished family in one of the poorest towns of Milan. His father sold vegetables on the street, but died a few months before Leonardo was born. His mom didn't have any suitable job, so she did whatever odd job she could find to make ends meet. However, the burden of catering for five children alone soon became too much for her and she eventually had to come to a decision that would change Leonardo's life forever. One day she packed Leonardo's little things and told him they were going on a trip. Her seven-year-old son, who had never been on a trip before that fateful day, was excited. Little did Leonardo know he was going on a trip that would seal his fate forever. That day his mother took him to Martinet Institute Orphanage, where she begged the nuns to take her son. Her fourth son had left home and joined a street gang, and she was afraid Leonardo would suffer the same fate. It was a tough decision, but an ultimate sacrifice she had to make to keep her little boy alive. Leonardo would spend the next few months crying, brooding, and accepting his new reality. He felt rejected and betrayed, and couldn't understand why his mother would abandon him. It didn't help that life at an orphanage was different from anything he'd known up to that point. All the boys in the orphanage were cared for by strict personnel who didn't mind correcting them with severe punishments. But there was one good thing. Every boy had to learn a trade. Leonardo soon discovered his flair for crafting. So he promised himself that he would become a skilled craftsman so that he would never go hungry or get abandoned by anyone again in his life. Seven years later, Leonardo would leave the orphanage to become an apprentice, a decision he'll forever be grateful for. In 1949, Leonardo began his career as an apprentice to a tool and dye maker in Milan. Speaking of this time in his later years, Leonardo said, I started as the shop boy. They didn't call me Leonardo, but simply boy. The apprenticeship he took upon earned him his first paycheck of 300 lire, which is about 15 euro cents for a tough 10 days of work. The pay wasn't great, or even enough for him to feed himself, but he became even more certain that his best bet of ensuring he'd never go hungry again was to become a skilled craftsman. Realizing this, Leonardo made a promise to himself to work extremely hard in order to make his dreams come true. And even when he lost his finger in an unfortunate incident at the factory, he didn't let it stop him. He knew the only way an orphan like him, with no money or friends, could make it was to work his ass and soul off and hope it pays. But just as much as Leonardo felt hard work was necessary for his pursuit of success, he also realized that hard work alone wouldn't be enough. So, despite not making enough money to meet his needs, Leonardo used his meager wages to attend design school at night in order to increase his odds of making his dreams a reality. It was here Leonardo would discover that he had a knack for making parts for glasses, and that discovery would change his life forever. But before that, Leonardo would spend the next few years learning all the ins and outs of the art of making glasses. After a few years of apprenticeship and schooling, Leonardo would graduate from the Brera Academy of Art in 1958 with a diploma in engraving. With the certificate in hand, Leonardo decided it was time to venture out on his own and set up a workshop manufacturing tools and parts for eyewear in Milan. In 
In 1961, 25-year-old Leonardo founded Luxottica under the financial backing of two of his customers and moved the factory to a small town in northeastern Italy called Agordo. Agordo around this time was filled with all the players in the eyeglass industry, so starting his company here was a risky decision that could have put his new company out of business even before it got off. But Leonardo believed in his skills and was confident he had what it took to thrive and potentially beat all his competitors. At the same time, he also decided to start his company here because he felt that for him to dominate the world's eyewear market, his first step would be to dominate the home of Italy's eyeglasses industry. It was a lofty dream, but never in his wildest dream would he have believed that this same company would someday be worth more than $60 billion. But for now, Luxottica's unstoppable rise had only just begun. Like most businesses, Leonardo's company didn't get up to a great start. But once people realized his frames were high quality, they began flocking his shop. And soon enough, Leonardo had 14 employees working for him. His company at the time only specialized in making small metal parts for glasses. But after doing this for six years, Leonardo began to get weary of it. He felt he could be doing so much more. And so, one day, he thought to himself, what if I stopped making glasses parts and decided to assemble them from start to finish myself? So, in 1967, Leonardo stopped making glasses for other brands and began to produce and sell eyeglasses. This move would mark the start of many innovative ideas and strategies that would take Luxottica to the top of the eyewear industry. Soon after that, Leonardo, always on the lookout for the latest technology, began investing in technology to improve his craft. By implementing technology in the production and design of his eyewear, Leonardo cemented his company's reputation for quality and reliability, the kind of thing customers and investors loved to associate themselves with. By 1971, Luxottica had become so successful that the company was getting so many orders that Leonardo had to stop manufacturing for others and focus solely on Luxottica. But despite Luxottica enjoying so much success and Leonardo within the touching of his dream, he still didn't feel satisfied. He realized that his position as a manufacturer only didn't enable him to get as close to his customers as he wanted to. So he decided to take another crucial step that would change that. In 1974, Leonardo Del Vecchio contacted the owners of Scaroni SPA, a wholesale distributor with important know-how in the Italian eyewear market, and offered to integrate their company with his. The owners of Scaroni were initially skeptical, but when they realized how profitable it would become, they shook hands and Scaroni became a part of the Luxottica Group. As the years went by, Luxottica became a reputable eyewear company in Italy, while Leonardo's fortunes incredibly increased. But Leonardo was still hungry for more. He wanted the brand to be recognized internationally. And so, in 1988, Leonardo took his rivals by surprise when he did something no other eyewear manufacturing company had thought of doing. Leonardo initially began to tinker with the idea of transforming glasses with a necessary medical device into a highly desirable, must-have fashion accessory in 1967. And although it was a brilliant idea, Leonardo had a lot on his plate then, so he chose to focus on other things. It wasn't until the 1980s that the idea popped up again. And this time, he decided to do something about it. So he reached out to famous fashion designer Giorgio Armani, who was also an Italian, and pitched the idea to him, saying, what if everyone got a glasses frame as they got shoes and bags? Armani loved the idea, but first, there was paperwork to be done. Once they sorted that out, Leonardo signed a licensing deal with Giorgio Armani that effectively made Luxottica the pioneer of fashion frames. However, this is not to say that Leonardo was the only one working on the idea at the time. 
Other popular designers, such as Pierre Cardin and Christian Dior, had also been experimenting with frames since the 1960s, but Leonardo was able to make that vision a reality. After signing the Armani deal, several fashion designers began to jump on the idea. For customers, it meant they could now wear Gucci, Prada, and Chanel as eyewear, thanks to Leonardo. However, Leonardo and his company were still not done. A few years after the Armani deal, Leonardo made yet another significant deal in 1992, when Luxottica signed licensing agreements with one of the oldest clothing retailers in the US, the Brooks Brothers. The Brooks Brothers at the time were known for their classic, elegant style that delivered functionality and high quality. It was exactly the kind of brand Luxottica needed to improve its reputation internationally. And almost immediately after the deal, Luxottica sales skyrocketed because more notable fashion brands started signing launching agreements with the company. It seemed like Leonardo, who kept ticking the right boxes, couldn't make any wrong decision. And by the early 2000s, Leonardo had transformed himself from the seven-year-old abandoned by his mother to one of the richest and most successful men in Italy. How did he do it? And what lessons could we learn here? Leonardo built the empire of Luxottica on two major insights, and the first one was by creating quality products. It's no secret that a quality product or service will surely sell with the right marketing. Just think about the most successful brands today. Apple, Tesla, Samsung, Ferrari, Rolex. One of the major factors behind their success is that they all offer way better quality than most of their competitors. Leonardo knew this, so he worked extremely hard to perfect his craft. Without this, Luxottica might have never reached where it is today. Leonardo also realized that the best way to control the quality of his products and still maximize profit was to manage all aspects of his eyewear production. For instance, after Luxottica's initial progression from parts to frames in the early 1970s, Leonardo took the company step by step to control the entire process of making and selling glasses. That means controlling everything, from acquiring raw materials to selling its own products in its own stores. However, providing quality products and controlling all aspects of production alone isn't enough to guarantee success. Leonardo took some risks that transformed Luxottica from a mid-sized company to an international brand. In 1989, Leonardo decided he wanted a retail network and took some big steps that many people thought were insane. First, he got Luxottica listed on the New York Stock Exchange, an almost unheard of move for a mid-sized Italian business. Several financial experts considered it reckless and even tried to persuade Leonardo not to do it, but he went ahead with it. The move eventually paid off as it laid the ground for Luxottica's hostile takeover of U.S. Shoe, a conglomerate that owned LensCrafters, America's largest optical chain in 1995. U.S. Shoe was five times larger than Luxottica, and its board members were not willing to sell to just any small eyewear company from Italy. But Leonardo did not care. He persisted, and his persistence soon paid off. In 1995, U.S. Shoe succumbed, and Luxottica bought the company for $1.4 billion. But this wasn't even the crazy part. Once he got the deal, Leonardo proceeded to achieve why he acquired the company in the first instance, for the retail outlets. He broke up the company, which had existed since 1879. He sold every other part of the corporation and filled LensCrafters, the retail outlets, with Luxottica's eyewear. He was ruthless when he had a goal to achieve, and this mentality is one of the reasons Luxottica became so successful. Luxottica didn't just acquire retail outlets alone, it also acquired iconic eyewear brands. Leonardo believed that the only way to expand Luxottica's presence internationally, especially in the lifestyle sector, was to dominate the eyewear industry. So, he began his conquest in the 1990s. 
In 1990, Luxottica acquired Vogue's eyewear and then Persol, an Italian eyewear brand in 1995. Four years later, the company acquired Ray-Ban, then Oakley in 2007, Oliver Peoples in 2007, Technol in 2012, Elaine Meekly International in 2013, Stark Eyes also in 2013, Glasses.com in 2014, Salmo Eragi and Vigano in 2016, Autocas Carol in 2017, and finally, Fukui Megane in 2018. He did the same in the US, where Leonardo equally acquired Sunglass Hut in 2001, OPSM in 2003, Pearl Vision in 2004, Cole National in 2004, Sears Optical in 2004, Target Optical Chain in 2006, and surveys in 2006, among several others in North America. If there's anything we can learn here is the endless strife to be the best and number one at anything you do. You might not be able to go around buying companies like Leonardo did, but you have to remember that there was a time when Luxottica was nothing but a pipe dream of an orphan. So, whatever your dream is, chase it aggressively. Leonardo's second insight was his decision to combine the optical business with the fashion industry, which we've already discussed at length. You see, if Leonardo had not decided to combine both, there's every chance that Luxottica would have remained the small-sized company it was in the 60s. You see, it's not enough for you to stay at a particular spot and not expand your business or dreams. Samsung has an insurance company. And the company also sells different electrical devices from the phone devices they're popularly known for. Amazon evolved from selling books alone to selling everything. And now, the company is into so much, while Apple is working on creating its own car. These are just a few examples of the need to diversify and incorporate new things or innovations that will set your business apart from your competitors. For Leonardo, it was first combining with the fashion industry to make glasses a must-wear accessory for everyone. And once he was able to do that, he proceeded to dive into making every form of eyewear on the market and buying as many eyewear brands across the world as possible. The success of this decision is there to see because when you walk into any major optical retail outlets around the globe today, there's a good chance that you'll acquire a product made by one of the brands Luxottica owns outrightly. Luxottica didn't stop at fashion glasses. They also proceeded to make swimming goggles, sports eyewear, and any frame used for the eyes. They moved with the times, made their products available online, and even signed a deal with Google to make intelligent eyewear. Luxottica acquired many more retail outlets as the years passed, but something still felt missing. There was still one more part of the eyewear industry that Luxottica had not taken over, which was lenses. And Leonardo knew Luxottica couldn't completely dominate the eyewear industry without it. At the time, Essilor was known as a major manufacturer of lenses. And this time, Leonardo could not buy his way. Many people believed a deal would never happen until Leonardo took the world by surprise when he managed to get a deal to merge Luxottica with Essilor on the 1st of October, 2018. The name of the company was changed to Essilor Luxottica after the merger and is currently the world's largest eyewear company. With the merger, Essilor Luxottica now commands more than one quarter of global value eye sales. Currently, Essilor Luxottica is categorized as a monopoly with about 180,000 employees and a net worth of $65 billion. On June 27, 2022, Essilor Luxottica announced the passing of its chairman, Leonardo Del Vecchio. From his founding Luxottica at the young age of 25 up until his death at 87 years of age, Leonardo never really stopped working. He kept giving himself a goal to do more. Right before his death, Leonardo had planned to push Essilor Luxottica to the exclusive club of companies valued at more than $100 billion. He was also looking to shake up Italy's financial industry. But he was stopped by the one thing capable of stopping him. Today, Luxottica has six factories in Italy, two in China, and one in the United States. 
with a current net worth of $65.5 billion, making it the Rolex of the eyewear industry. Leonardo Del Vecchio had about as rocky a start to life as is possible, but in the end, he managed to turn it all around. So, what's stopping you?